those jobs, which is, is patently absurd because those people, many of them lived on subsistence economies. True, they may never have made any money before, but they lived very well on subsistence economies until these companies came in and created uh, a local market, a, a local economy that, that now depends on the dollar. So in a very few years, they've gone from living subsistence lives and statistically having no money at all, totally impoverished, statistically, but their lives are quite good, to now suddenly having to work for these big corporations, working in these sweatshops, making a dollar a day, dependent on the dollar economy, or maybe it's ten dollars a day, whatever, but dependent on, the, uh, on that money and, and the subsistence existence they had before is gone, and then that company the next year decides that the labor pool is cheaper someplace else and they move out. And these people who become dependent on these these pittances they've been paid by our companies suddenly don't have even the pittance. And it's a terribly tragic situation. And the men and women who are the equivalent of the of the corporate economic hit people who who are doing this, I know them, I know a number of them personally. In their hearts they know what they're doing is wrong but they're being well rewarded, their families are being taken care of, someone's patting them on the back saying, isn't it wonderful that you're making it possible for these people to get a dollar a day? And they have a whole team, as I said before, psychologists, economists, and lawyers telling them that everything they do is perfectly good and for the best and for the best of the world. That's how we build empire. So tell us about Panama, because it became evident when you read the book that you actually ended up having a friendly relationship with that country's leader. Omar Torrijos, yes. I, I, I would like to think of him as a, as a good friend. And, um, you know, as I think I said earlier, Mike, sometimes when I, when I look at my own story and I just heard you ask that question, I'm thinking, Omar Torrijos, when I first went to Panama, his, his picture was up on this billboard, and he was a mythical figure to me. He was probably going to be up for a Nobel Prize had he not been assassinated. Um, he was in, in a, a bigger than one of these bigger-than-life people, and, and to think that I spent time with him and met him, uh, as I look back, is just pretty amazing to me. This, 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 this young man from rural New Hampshire. My, my, and my life, it, it seems unbelievable to me at times. If I hadn't lived it, I'm not sure. I, you know, it's, it, and as you read the book, I tried to write it to bring out some of that feeling. And um, it, it, I sometimes it reads more like a James Bond novel, I think, than, than, most, than, than, than the biographies of most economists. But that's the life I, I lived. It was that way. Um, Great food, great booze, fast women, and uh, lots of power, money, sex, the whole works, you know. And Omar Torrijos was a magnificent man. Um, he had his faults, like everybody. But he saw that, clearly what I was going to do, he invited me to this little bungalow outside Panama City to have a private meeting with him. And he said, look, you know, I know what you're doing. I know the game you guys are playing. And I know what you're going to do is inflate all these forecasts, and you're going to give me a system I, that, that, that I can use and, and, and a few of my wealthy friends, but my country's going to suffer, and your country's going to get rich, and you're going to have a hold on me. What you really want is my canal. So I'm not going to let this happen. Um, he said, you know, but what, what, what I will do is if, if you will agree with me to come in here and, and do a study and, um, uh, you know, put together a plan, that really helps my people, helps the poorest of the poor, then I'll see to it that you and your company get more and more projects. But you've got to be honest, you've got to do good work. So basically what he was telling me is, don't be an economic hitman, be a real, be what you, you know, truly be what you say you are, and, and do a good job at it. And I welcomed this, of course, and ultimately so did my company, because it got business. But of course, uh, what Omar Torrijos was doing in this process was defying the whole system. Because the system is built on an assumption that the people at the top are all corruptible. And if you find someone at the top who isn't corruptible, then he can destroy the system, not only in that country, but in many other places. Because once someone starts to resist and someone starts to point out the truth behind the system and the fact that it can be opposed, then everybody in the system sees a threat and is in trouble. We've watched this happen so many places. Arbenz in Guatemala, Allende in Chile, uh, Torrijos 
in Panama, we've seen it happen in Africa, we've seen it happen in Asia, in the Middle East, we've seen it happen over and over and over again. And these men who, who take that stance are taking their lives in their hand, literally. Now, Torrijos successfully, ultimately negotiated a canal treaty with uh, President Carter's administration. The canal treaty passed our, 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 our Congress by one vote, and it was very divisive. And, of course, the, the uh, right-wing conservative elements strongly, strongly opposed it. The other thing that was happening is that Torrijos was negotiating with the Japanese to build a sea-level canal. Uh, the current canal is based on locks, and it can't take the largest of, of our ships. And so a sea-level canal would be able to do this. So the Japanese were saying that they would finance it, and then, of course, if they finance it, they would construct it. Well, this deeply upset... Uh, the, our big construction companies. And at that time, the president of one of those largest companies was George Schultz, the senior uh, counsel lawyer on that, on that, at, 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 at Bechtel, was Caspar Weinberger. They were very incensed that, that, that Torrijos was even talking to the Japanese about this. Um, after the Canal Treaty was, was negotiated, and Carter then lost the next election to Reagan, Schultz came out of being president of Bechtel and became Secretary of State. Weinberger left Bechtel and became Secretary of Defense. And the Reagan administration tried to renegotiate the Canal Treaty with Torrijos. He wouldn't do it. They tried to get uh, him to agree to specifics like leaving our military bases in there. And, most importantly of all, they desperately tried to get him to stop talking to the Japanese about a sea-level canal. He refused. He was a very integritous man in these regards. He absolutely refused. And so one day his twin otter plane, the presidential plane, uh, blew up um, and he was killed. And I, I, I was waiting for it to happen. Uh, this is the way the jackals do things. And uh, there was a lot of evidence that a tape recorder that he'd been given before the plane took off was a bomb. There's no question in my mind, and there's no question in a lot of the minds of a lot of the investigators throughout South America, people knew that this was a CIA-orchestrated assassination. Of course, it hardly made our press. And next, Noriega took over. Um, and, and Noriega was not an Omar Torrijos by any means. He... He was a much more corrupt individual. He had a lot of very unpleasant personal habits. Uh, he was not charismatic. But he stuck to his guns to a large degree. He, too, refused to give up negotiating with the Japanese. He refused to renegotiate the Canal Treaty. He refused to allow the, the American military bases to stay. They, they left and went to Ecuador. Um, and uh, so... Um, as an upshot of that, of course, we invaded Panama in 1989. Two to three thousand Panamanians, innocent civilians, were killed in the process. And Noriega was uh, taken prisoner and still sits in a prison in Miami, Florida. Did you ever hear firsthand about using the jackals if you guys failed in your endeavors? Was that something that Claudine had told you about, or I mean, how, how do you know that for sure? Yeah, Claudine did tell me about that. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was one of the motivating forces for me to do a good job, and all of us, economic hitmen. We didn't want to see the jackals come in. I sure just did not want to see Omar Torrijos assassinated. Um, so it was an inspiration for us. It was one of the things that concerned me when I worked out this deal with Omar to really do a, 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 the real job rather than an economic hitman job. And I talk about this extensively in Confessions of an Economic Hitman, that um, at, at one point I got very concerned that the Torrijos, you know, that, all right, I'm going along with what he's saying, and I'm happy that I'm doing it, but what's, this, what's the implications for him, and ultimately for me? Um, we knew the jackals were always there lurking in the shadows, and it was a tremendous push for us to do what, what we were supposed to do and do it efficiently so they wouldn't have to come in. They're very much a part of the system, and I knew a number of them personally, and I still do. I know a couple of them who are now in, in Iraq. Uh, 